of objectivism. Excellent, excellent. I'm very glad to hear that. Now, over the years, devotees of Ranch have put out their own versions of objectivism. Did any of them get it right? The problem was, no, I, have, I, have, I think so. I think Leonard Peebop's lectures that would be correct technically. Mm -hmm. My problem with a book like uh, Leonard Peacock's book on, uh, on objectivism, I'm sure that it's a quite accurately correct presentation of objectivism. My quarrel with that kind of book is a different kind entirely. It wouldn't persuade anybody who wasn't already already a true believer. There's nothing in it which has any passion, any involvement with human beings, in an intimate and personal, non-abstract, non-professorial way. And what one needed was more of the same passion that we found in the novels of Ayn Rand. We wanted to see a, a version of that in lectures on the philosophy of Ayn Rand. And that's the one thing that these folks don't seem to know anything about. That's a very important distinction, and I'm very glad I asked in that. Thank you for that answer. Now, as, as I understand it, you are still in basic agreement with the major tenets of objectivism. What part, if any, of Ayn Rand's philosophy have you broken with or have always disagreed with? I can't think of anything that I always disagreed with. Uh, I, there are a lot of things I didn't disagree with, but some things I, I was confused about that made me uncomfortable, but I didn't think them through carefully enough until after the break. Uh, some years ago, I was I gave a lecture called The Benefits and Hazards of the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, because by then there were certain issues that I knew I disagreed with passionately, and I needed to get it on the record. When I wrote the or transcribed the basic principles of objectivism, I included as an edited epilogue the benefits and hazards of the philosophy of Ayn Rand, so that the book has the balance between the first version, the, all the orthodox areas of agreement and admiration, and then we segue into where are the issues that need to be challenged and rethought, which is what the last chapter of the epilogue does. Mm. And even then, it's not a complete description of everything that I uh, cited, but it's enough to get people started thinking. Okay, that's excellent. I'm glad that's in the book as well. It, it sounds like a very well-rounded approach then. Now, how rewarding is it to have finished this book knowing that you have faith, faithfully recorded a comprehensive exploration of not only Ayn Rand's philosophy, but essentially your own philosophy as well? Well, I got one piece of good news to support me. <laughs> Almost everything which I think is easily available in many books of mine that I have written. For example, so I don't have to worry too much about that because, in fact, many people have contacted me and said, this is the missing link on objectivism, what you have provided in books like The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. Or they would say to me, thank you for giving objectivism back to me. Meaning by that, that if you understand it doesn't have to be right about everything, there's still a great deal to admire. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, one thing I've always admired about you is your work ethic and prolific output of writing, which I hold up as a model for my own work life. Now, you will be 80 years old in April. Do you have any other books in the works? You don't think I deserve a rest? <laughs> I do, actually. Well, no, I have different ideas I'm kicking around in my head. Sometimes just an idea for a title but I'm nowhere near defining, defining what I'll do next. Something will come to me. It always does with writers. <laughs> now, are you still seeing individual clients in your psychotherapy practice? And if so, what's yeah. the best way for viewers to contact you? Um, I do definitely do private practice in psychotherapy of two kinds. One is one-on-one -on -one in the usual sense, and the other is a, a, a therapy group. I like working in groups, and uh, to get a contact with me, I'll give you first of all a phone number, then an email. Email is better than, than phone numbers, actually, I think I would correct that and say I'll give you an email. 
Nathaniel at NathanielBrandon.com. I'll say that again. It's very hard to forget because of the redundancy. <laughs> Nathaniel at NathanielBrandon.com. And the second fallback contact point can be found in my website. What's the website? NathanielBrandon.com. Excellent. Okay. I will include links to that uh, website as well. And you can do um, the individual clients over the phone, I imagine. And for groups, do they, people have to be in the Los Angeles area? I'm sorry, would you mind asking that again? Sure. For groups, for the group therapies, do people have to be in the Los Angeles area? but individual clients can be anywhere and talk to you over the phone? Yes, the group therapy is only for people who live in Los Angeles. Uh, but the rest of my, pra my private practice, one-on-one, -on -one, is around 80% on the telephone with people from all over the world. I mean, right now I have a client in Moscow, I have a client in the, in the, in the UK, and then in Australia, so it's kind of exciting to have a chance to work with people from different worlds, different cultures in some cases. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I know that people will want to know that, that you are available by phone. So thank you so much, Nathaniel, for sharing your insights and your wisdom today. It's a privilege to talk to you, and I appreciate your warmth and generosity. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.